In this video, we're going to be discussing the test item cluster for a full thickness rotator cuff tear. This cluster was evaluated by Park et al. in 2005, and it consists of these three tests. So if you suspect that your patient does have a rotator cuff pathology, you might want to consider these three tests in the cluster. Those are the painful arc sign, the drop arm sign, and the infraspinatus manual muscle test, also called the resistant infraspinatus test. Now, as standalone tests, each of these has individual psychometric properties like sensitivity and specificity, which you can see there on the right, and we will go into those later on in this video. However, when you perform all three tests of the cluster, the advantage is, is you can pool the results, and those pooled results give you positive likelihood ratios, and those are shown down there in the bottom left of the red box. So when two of these tests are positive, it does not matter which two, the positive likelihood ratio associated with that full thickness rotator cuff tear is 3.57. When all three of these tests are positive, the positive likelihood ratio jumps all the way to 15.6. A positive likelihood ratio of five is moderate evidence that they have the given pathology. So 3.57 is less than that by about one and a half. It's not great. So if you have two of these positive, you can't definitively say that they have a full thickness rotator cuff tear. To be able to confidently say that, you really need to have all three of these tests be positive. Notice that the positive likelihood ratio is 15.6. We've said in other videos that when you have a positive likelihood ratio of at least 10, that is excellent evidence that the person has the given pathology. So given that this is 15.6, that's quite a bit above 10. If all three of these are positive, you can pretty definitively say that they have a rotator cuff pathology. So now that we understand the test item cluster, let's look at the individual tests. We're now going to talk about the painful arc test. This test is a component of two test item clusters. One is for subacromial impingement syndrome, and the other is for a full thickness rotator cuff tear. Before we go any further into this other stuff, let's just look and see how the test is done. It's very simple. You're going to have the patient in standing like I am here, and then the patient will actively abduct their shoulder through its entire range of motion, whatever range of motion they have. I don't have either of those conditions, so I'm able to get my arm up all the way to approximately 180 degrees. But if a patient has one of these two conditions, don't expect them to be able to get the arm up that far. Now, if we look at the psychometrics here, the sensitivity is very low. It's only 0.33, so it's very bad at ruling out a condition, given this test is negative. But the specificity is moderately good. It's 0.81, meaning that if a patient has a positive painful arc test, there's an 81% chance that they have one of these two conditions right here. So what constitutes a positive painful arc test? It would be reproduction of the patient's shoulder pain. However, it's going to occur over a particular arc of motion. When we say an arc like this, we mean a range of angles. The study that investigated the painful arc test defined those angles between 60 degrees of abduction and 120 degrees of abduction. Now, clinically speaking, you may see it as low as 45 degrees. And so a lot of times when you Google this, like this picture here, you'll see that painful arc between 45 degrees and 120. When you're doing this in the clinic, does it really matter if it's exactly 60 or 50 or 45 or 40 degrees? No, there's just an arc of pain as they go through shoulder abduction, okay? So if they have that arc of pain, that would be considered a positive test. Now, this test is also useful because it can help you differentiate between a rotator cuff tear and subacromial impingement syndrome. So this is not a hard and fast rule, but it seems to be pretty widespread throughout patients. If somebody has a true rotator cuff tear, the entire active range of motion of abduction will be painful, meaning it'll still be painful from 45 degrees to 120, However, it will also be painful from 0 to 45, meaning that as I go from my arm to my side right here, all the way up, that entire active range of motion is going to be painful. Now, other than being a part of these two test item clusters, there's another really important utility of the painful arc test. 
it can help us differentiate between a rotator cuff tear and subacromial impingement syndrome. So let's suppose somebody has a true rotator cuff tear. There my arm is by my side and now I'm abducting it all the way. If I had a rotator cuff tear, it would not just be painful between 45 degrees and 120, it would also be painful from zero to 45 degrees, meaning that pain would occur throughout the entire active range of motion of abduction. Now it might be worse in some areas than others, but the whole movement generally will be painful. If somebody has true impingement syndrome, they probably will not have pain between zero and 45. The pain will actually begin at 45 degrees and will continue on upward. So really it's that first 30, 40, 45 degrees of abduction that helps you differentiate between a rotator cuff tear and impingement syndrome. So hopefully that makes sense. We're now going to look at the drop arm sign. This test is unique to the full thickness rotator cuff tear test item cluster, but remember those other two there, painful arc and the resisted infraspinatus, are also a part of the subacromial impingement syndrome cluster. Now depending on the source, you might see a couple different ways this test is performed. I'm going to show you here the most common way it's done in a clinical setting. So you can either begin with the patient in seated or standing. I of course have the patient standing right here. I'm going to then take his arm and passively abduct his shoulder to 90 degrees while keeping his elbow straight. Once I get to that position, I'm going to quickly let go of his arm, and his job is to keep the arm elevated in that same position. Now, assuming he has a healthy rotator cuff, he should be able to hold that position no problem. But if somebody has a rotator cuff tear, they're either going to not be able to maintain that position, and or they're going to have some pain once I let go and they have to activate those muscles, okay? So first we're gonna look at a negative test right here. So I take his arm and I'm gonna passively abduct his shoulder to 90 degrees, elbow is straight, and then I let go. That's clearly a negative test because when I let go, he's able to quickly activate those muscles and hold the position, but also he had no pain, okay? So that is a negative drop arm test or negative drop arm sign. Let's now look at a positive test. So in a positive test, like we said, he's either not going to be able to maintain that position or there's going to be reproduction of his familiar shoulder pain. So here, passively abduct to 90 degrees, elbow straight, I let go, and you can see there there's a little bit of lag. So he is not able to maintain that position. This would be a positive drop arm sign. Most likely, it would also be associated with pain. One other word here on a positive test. If we go back here and look at this, bring him to the test position, and then I let go, if he's able to maintain the position, but he gets reproduction of his familiar shoulder pain, that is still a positive test. Notice that it says inability to maintain the position and or reproduction of their shoulder pain. So despite the fact that he might be able to hold the arm up, the fact that this reproduces his familiar shoulder pain means that there's probably a rotator cuff pathology there. It just might be a little more minor and not producing a whole lot of weakness yet. We're now going to talk about the resisted infraspinatus test, also called the resisted external rotation test. In reality, this is just an external rotation manual muscle test for the shoulder. And notice it's a part of two test item clusters, one for subacromial impingement syndrome and another for full thickness rotator cuff tear. If we look at the psychometrics, the specificity isn't great, it's 0.74, but the sensitivity as a standalone test is 0.90 or 90%. Given this higher sensitivity, this means that we can use this test as a screening tool to rule out one of these two shoulder pathologies. So if we do a resisted infraspinatus test and the result is negative, that means that there's a 90% chance that they do not have these two conditions, subacromial impingement syndrome or a full thickness rotator cuff tear. Now the way you perform this test is identical to how you do the manual muscle test because it is a manual muscle test. You can have the patient in standing or seated. I'd prefer to have them in seated like you see right here. The patient's gonna begin with their shoulder in neutral, meaning arm and elbow by the side. The elbow's gonna be bent to 90 degrees like this. 
and their thumb is going to be face up. And what I'm going to do as the practitioner is I'm going to apply a force on their forearm, trying to push their forearm inwards, and they're going to resist by trying to attempt to move the shoulder into external rotation. So here I am applying that inward force, and he's going to resist that by using his shoulder external rotators. A positive test here is going to be reproduction of the patient's familiar shoulder pain, and we'll probably also see weakness on that side compared to the unaffected side. Now obviously this would be a negative test because one, there was no weakness, and also there was no pain reported with this force. One more thing, when you're doing this test, make sure that the patient's arm and elbow stays against their side. Sometimes if there's weakness or extreme pain, they may compensate by allowing their forearm to come in, but then their arm flares out. 